Festival international du film d'animation d'Annecy. Bonjour à tous, je vous souhaite la bienvenue pour ce quatrième et avant-dernier petit déjeuner qui fait donc écho à la séance de court-métrage en compétition numéro 4. Et on va commencer les interviews avec le réalisateur Quentin Bayeux pour le film Le Mans 1955. Bonjour Quentin. Bonjour. Ça va bien Très bien. On va donc un peu parler de votre film. Donc Quentin, euh, ce film, comme le titre euh, le suggère très fortement, oui. est basé sur une tragique euh, histoire vraie. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler euh, de la construction du film euh, comment vous avez, euh, Quels ont été vos choix d'écriture ouais. euh, Déjà à la base, donc, ouais, pour résumer un petit peu euh, le film, donc, il se base sur cette histoire vraie. C'est en 1955, une voiture euh, pendant la, la course des 24 heures du Mans s'est craché dans les tribunes, dans le public, et a fait 81 morts chez les spectateurs. Et la course a continué jusqu'au lendemain. Moi, je ne connaissais pas du tout euh, cet événement. Euh, je suis tombé un petit peu par hasard, parce que enfant, euh, j'étais un peu passionné de voiture. Et euh, ça m'a repris euh, il y a quelques années. Et je suis tombé par hasard dessus. Et surtout, en fait, euh, c'était un moment où euh, j'essayais d'écrire des films. Et en fait, sur, euh, en tapant le Mans 55 sur, euh, sur Internet, sur Google Images, il y avait ces deux images euh, hyper paradoxales. Il y avait euh, l'image du charnier, du, du, de, de l'accident, une image insupportable de corps. Et euh, juste à côté, l'image d'à côté, il y avait la, une, une image de pilote qui fait ça au champagne, qui sable le champagne au, au lendemain. Et, ça. et euh, c'est juste né de là, en fait. Le lien, a, euh, Ouais, euh, l'envie le, en fait, de faire un lien, de créer le lien en fait, et d'essayer de comprendre en fait, comment ces deux images peuvent être euh, liées. En fait. et, euh, ouais, voilà. On voit clairement dans votre, dans votre filmographie effectivement euh, cette, euh, cet esthétisme qui, euh, qui ressort à travers, euh, à travers vos designs, euh, mais aussi euh, la notion de, de vitesse, euh, ouais. les corps en mouvement, euh, donc précédemment les hommes, les chevaux, les véhicules. Est-ce que ce film était particulièrement un challenge pour vous à ce niveau ah, C'est une bonne question. Euh, C'était, en tout cas, dans, dans le, pour parler du mouvement, ça a été vraiment un challenge. Cette fois, pas tant pour le, les corps en mouvement que les visages en mouvement. La plupart du temps, en fait, euh, j'ai un style assez froid. J'avais fait ouais, des films avant où c'était pratiquement des masques, en fait, euh, les personnages étaient assez peu vivants. Et euh, cette fois, ouais, c'était euh, un peu un pari, j'avais un peu peur, je croisais un peu les doigts pour que ça fonctionne, justement, mais techniquement, on a trouvé des solutions pour faire vivre euh, ces persos. Et, euh, et, euh, et, euh, et ouais, les, rendre des émotions, ce que je n'avais pas du tout avant. Avant, c'était le corps qui donnait de l'émotion, si on avait. Et euh, là, je voulais vraiment, cette fois-ci, le défi, c'était surtout euh, s'arrêter sur des, sur des visages, quoi, ce que je faisais un petit peu moins avant. J'avais tendance à cadrer beaucoup plus sur le, sur le corps, justement, qui, qui s'exprime. Là, plus sur les visages et essayer justement de prendre le temps de presque filmer des acteurs. Quoi. Hmm. Euh, la musique, elle est très présente dans le film. Euh, on peut dire qu'elle est grandiose, même ouais. elle, elle accentue le côté euh, stylisé. Ouais. Euh, bon, précédemment, vous avez fait plusieurs clips. Ouais. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler un peu de ce choix de composition musicale, puisque ouais. si je ne me trompe pas, elle est originale Oui, alors il y a la, les trois quarts des musiques euh, qui sont euh, originales. Il euh, y a une séquence au milieu du film, qui est une séquence de course, où euh, c'était à la toute fin, ça avait été un petit peu compliqué. Le, 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 le compositeur Ali Wallwine, qui était aux états unis en fait, n'a pas eu le temps à la fin et tout ça pour ce tronçon-là, qui a été fait vraiment à la toute fin, c'était un peu euh, compliqué. 
même en, en réel. Et euh, c'est une musique euh, libre, enfin euh, euh, une musique euh, libre de noix, enfin euh, au maître en fait. Euh, et ça tombait euh, parfaitement, euh, elle, elle est très bien, j'en suis très contente. Et, euh, et non, la musique, moi, le choix de la musique euh, ouais, qui est assez ample et tout ça, c'est vraiment aussi... Euh, le film, il est vraiment dans l'idée d'essayer de... Moi j'aime bien ce cinéma-là, un petit peu, euh, on peut dire surannée. Des, euh, des années 40, 50, 60. Et c'était vraiment dans l'idée de revenir à quelque chose d'un petit peu classique de cette façon-là et d'essayer de s'y frotter un petit peu et d'essayer ça. Donc ça faisait partie aussi d'essayer d'avoir une musique contemporaine à ce cinéma-là. Enfin, euh, en tout cas, directement liée à ce cinéma-là de, de, de Otto Preminger et euh, même Hitchcock un petit peu. Il y, a, il y avait ces, ces influences-là, quoi. De Bernard Herrmann et tout ça. Mm. La musique, elle assure quand même un, un fil conducteur à travers euh, tout le film. Ouais. Euh, et en, en contrepoint, il y a beaucoup d'ellipses euh, ouais. au niveau visuel. Est-ce que vous pouvez aussi nous parler un peu de cet équilibre-là Oui. Ben, a... En fait, le, 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 donc, cette histoire du Mans 55, elle est, euh, elle est hyper ample. En fait. on, on pourrait en parler pour, euh, pour beaucoup plus longtemps que 15 minutes. Et donc, euh, il a fallu faire des choix. Et puis, j'avais quand même envie de garder une, une ampleur malgré les 15 minutes. Le film euh, se devait d'aller vite pour ces 15 minutes-là. Et du coup, euh, l'ellipse, euh, c'est quelque chose que j'aime beaucoup, essayer de réfléchir justement à l'ellipse, et et, 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 qui donne une espèce d'amplitude justement, et d'essayer de, de réfléchir à ces, à, à ces transitions. C'est quelque chose en mise en scène qui me plaît, euh, qui me plaît beaucoup. C'est toujours quelque chose que je regarde beaucoup aussi dans les films, comment on peut se débrouiller avec ça. Je me souviens, ben, c'est euh, le film de Linklater, la Boy A. Non, Boy A. Enfin, bon. Un film dernièrement qui, dans ses ellipses, était vraiment hyper bien foutu là-dessus. Et euh, la musique, quoi, ouais, elle aide un petit peu à, la, à, à fluidifier un petit peu tout ça, je pense aussi. C'est euh, un film que je voulais euh, généreux aussi. On, est, euh, on a tendance à, 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 à se dire que euh, utiliser de la musique, c'est aussi facile puisque ça accompagne l'émotion de ça. Mais c'est un film que je voulais vraiment généreux comme ça aussi. Et, et euh, pas tant euh, cinéma, je ne le voulais pas élitiste, quoi, le film. Et, euh, et vraiment essayer de faire aussi euh, plaisir. Euh, D'où, par exemple, cette séquence de course euh, au milieu, alors que je voulais à la base pas faire un, un film de course, mais il faut expliquer plein de choses, c'est compliqué. Il euh, faut expliquer comment marche une course automobile à cette époque-là, les 24 heures du Mans. Donc il y a un côté assez didactique au début du film pour essayer de... Ensuite, à la moitié du film, une fois que l'accident arrive, en fait, de, 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 de faire un virage complètement à 90 degrés pour plus parler de course. En fait, on fait pas, passe d'un film de sport à un drame. Mais euh, ouais, il y a toujours eu cet élan de générosité, sur, euh, que ce soit sur le montage euh, et sur, euh, sur les musiques aussi. Ouais. Ouais. Très bien. Est-ce qu'il euh, y a des questions dans l'Assemblée la, dans Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, bon, J'ai revu avec plaisir votre film hier. Euh, bon déjà, je, outre la qualité graphique bien sûr de, de l'animation, le son est, est fantastique. Moi ça m'a rappelé justement parce que bon, à vu mon âge, à l'époque nous écoutions donc le, le Mans, les, les mmh. grandes courses à la radio. Et effectivement, j'étais complètement baigné dans, mmh. dans cette ambiance euh, de mmh. l'époque, hein, puisque mmh. vous, il y avait toujours des flashs. Euh, mmh. La question c'est, est-ce que vous avez écouté des bandes de l'époque mmh. Et la deuxième question c'est, est-ce que Mercedes a vu le film euh, alors la première question, euh, les bandes de l'époque en fait elles sont, c'est très bruyant hein, la course automobile donc elles sont difficilement, euh, elles sont pas très précises et en fait ce que j'ai surtout fait c'est en fait euh, j'ai frayé et traîné un petit peu avec des gens de, qui font encore ça aujourd'hui, ça existe encore en fait des courses automobiles classiques et euh, aussi euh, j'ai rencontré des, des, des gens d'une d'une plus vieille génération aussi qui ont ce genre de, de voiture là j'avais aussi l'envie, en fait en animation j'ai ma copine qui, fait du, qui est réalisatrice en, en prise de vue réelle et en fait ce, que, ce dont je suis toujours jaloux euh, c'est que le tournage et les expériences de tournage c'est des vraies expériences de vie aussi en animation c'est vrai qu'on est souvent derrière un ordinateur ou derrière une feuille de papier et que la journée d'avant ressemble beaucoup à la journée d'après et j'avais envie en fait sur ce, ce film là aussi de sortir un petit peu donc tous les sons des voitures par exemple sont pris en vrai on a été sur des circuits il y a un, euh, Xavier Dreyfus, l'ingénieur du son qui a fait le mix, qui a tout fait, qui a été extrêmement, qui a, qui a fait tout le son mis à part la musique, qui a été extrêmement euh, 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 
investi dans le projet. Et, euh, on a été à Dijon et on n'a enregistré... pas pu enregistrer les voitures exactement. Mais j'ai parlé un petit peu à des puristes, on a essayé de se rapprocher de, du bruit des moteurs, c'est les mêmes années, mais c'est des voitures qui euh, roulent encore aujourd'hui, puisque celles du film, elles sont dans des musées, euh, on ne peut plus les sortir. En fait. Et, euh, et ouais, il ouais, y avait vraiment cette envie de, 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 de s'imprégner de ça, et d'avoir le graphisme qui est quand même assez froid, et pas abstrait, mais quand même très graphique, quoi, et d'avoir un son pour le coup très, très vrai, quoi. essayer de voir comment ça pouvait marcher le, le paradoxe en, en de trucs là et voir si on pouvait lier un truc je pense que ouais, le, le son il a aidé c'était une partie une des parties du coup comme c'était sortir un petit peu à l'extérieur c'était une partie hyper agréable quoi et euh, pour mercedes on les avait euh, à un moment je me souviens que mes producteurs avaient essayé de les approcher et en même temps les approcher moi ça me mettait mal à l'aise parce que du coup ils pouvaient avoir aussi un peu une mainmise sur le film je les écorne pas vraiment parce qu'il y a des points un peu flous dans l'histoire euh, qui pourraient les écorner. Mais comme c'est flou, j'avais pas envie non plus de créer une, une espèce de polémique euh, et tout ça. C'est pas le moment, c'est pas le film, j'ai pas le temps. Si je veux les attaquer là-dessus, il faut dérouler quelque chose de beaucoup plus long. Et euh, du coup, ouais, non, je voulais pas de main C'est pareil pour euh, Le Mans, on a essayé de les approcher un moment, mais on sentait que du coup, il y aurait aussi peut-être un, un peu de contrôle de, de leur part et que c'est un court-métrage et que je voulais essayer de, de, de garder un petit peu de, de, ouais, de, de contrôle un peu là-dessus. Ouais. Voilà. On prend une dernière oui. question rapide par ici. Oui, euh, comment vous avez, écrit les vous avez écrit les dialogues, je suppose, oui. puisque comment vous les avez imaginés, euh, mmh. le, le cas de conscience que se posent tous, tous ces hommes, mmh. vous avez dû l'imaginer ça Oui, ben, euh, le film est hyper documenté, et euh, ça a été ça a ma limite aussi à un moment, c'est la première fois que j'écrivais vraiment une fiction, comme, euh, comme disait euh, Clément, ça, euh, au départ, je faisais beaucoup de clips et tout ça. Donc écrire, c'est difficile. Ce n'est pas du tout euh, ma, mon naturel. Et euh, à, à beaucoup de documentation, en fait, la façon dont c'est écrit. Donc tous les, toutes les prises de décision sont réelles. Mais forcément, c'est 15 minutes, donc elles sont vulgarisées un peu. Et, et euh, les dialogues, euh, je les ai écrits en français, qui ont été ensuite traduits en anglais, puisque le, le film... Euh, les gens parlent la langue de, de, de la vraie vie quoi. à cette époque là c'était déjà le, il y a du français, il y a un peu d'espagnol à certains moments, il y a de l'allemand et euh, ça a été traduit on a discuté, euh, on, ça a été quand même pas mal changé avec les acteurs en fait. euh, c'est la première fois aussi où je dirigeais des acteurs aussi longtemps finalement aussi profondément et, euh, et on, on a beaucoup euh, discuté avec eux c'était euh, intéressant. Le choix des acteurs aussi, euh, ils sont très, très forts. Euh, je suis vraiment euh, hyper admiratif du travail qu'ils ont fait sur le film. Mais il y avait aussi cette espèce d'envie. J'avais envie aussi de, de prendre des acteurs qui avaient une générosité et qui avaient envie de travailler sur le projet et de, de, de m'aider à écrire ces dialogues. Parce qu'il y avait une première version qui, sur la plupart des dialogues, ont été changés aussi. Et ont été, on a précisé. On a, ouais. Merci. Voilà. Merci, Quentin. Merci. Merci. I'd like to invite on stage now Pedro Casavecchia for Pulsion. Welcome. Hello. Hello. So, Pedro, um, you have a background of generalist TV and you're passionate about VFX. How did you come to make your first uh, film as a director? So um, I was working in Brazil, uh, doing commercials for lots of years, and I really wanted to try out uh, working in the VFX industry. And I figured out that maybe having a short film would, would be something that helped me achieve that. So I started producing it uh, like four years ago, but then I got the job before finishing it. And with the things I learned, coming to living in London and working in the big industry, I decided to kind of start over and try to do it a bit better uh, with things I was learning, and that was the basic drive to, to do it. And um, as a professional from Argentina, uh, currently living, as you said, in the UK, uh, how have you met your French producer? So that came after I started working on the, the film. My brother started working with them before. He's also a director. And he introduced me to them. They were interested into the film, so they started helping me out to distribute it. So Atlas V is the, the French producers that are helping me with it. Okay. And um, 
let's talk about your references and uh, inspirations. Um, what, uh, yeah, what inspired you at the very beginning of, uh, of this? So um, I started looking for references. I didn't really know what to do. I knew I wanted to do anything, but I started thinking that maybe I should use the things I'm interested in in general. And I'm really interested in this like true crime um, documentaries and serial killer biographies. Not so much into the act of killing, but the psychological part on why these people end up doing these kind of things. So I was really invested into these kind of things. And I remember when I was a kid watching David Firth, that is a, an, an English animator, that he do this he kind of creepy uh, short films that I used to love when I was a kid. And then uh, The Shining by Kubrick also gave me a huge uh, inspiration to try to do something mysterious and dark. Mm -hmm. Those are my main. main. The, the film made me think um, of uh, American Psycho with uh, Christian Bale? Yeah, well, I, I saw, I, I watched all, all sorts of films trying to pick up references, and yeah, all, all, the, all the big films of uh, horror, and, and I, I love all of those, and, and I try to do my best to pick up something from each one of them, mm -hmm. so I guess it's a big, big mashup of things I like. Mm -hmm. And to talk more about the technique, um, most of your sets are in the middle of nowhere, suspended in a black space. Would you explain uh, this choice and uh, how much is it symbolic or not? Well, um, I needed to, as I was producing it on my own, um, I needed to do something that was very minimalistic, let's say. So narrowing down the space of the scenarios helped me to really focus to a detail on a reduced space, so it was on the technical side because of that, and also because when I was gathering references and images I liked, uh, these kind of dioramas, these maquettes, I, I always I, I loved that, so I decided I would use that, and also this kind of miniature effect is something I, I like visually, so that ended up also giving me uh, this effect of isolating the characters as well, so works a bit of like the mind of the characters, and on a technical side as well, so that was my choice for these scenarios. Was it a, a way to um, put the spectator as a witness, you know? Exactly, yeah, you're, you're watching something terrible uh, develop in front of your eyes, but you cannot really do much about it, you're in a certain distance, but uh, I, I felt like that made the characters more helpless or hopeless. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to illustrate this uh, state of mind they are in, like, very narrowed and very isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, is there any question in the audience? Yes, over there, Patrick. Hi, I, is this on? Yeah, um, I really love the film. I, I, I was, this is an odd question, but horror is such a specific genre. Um, have you, are you going to exploit it within the horror film festival circuit? Because I always wish I had a horror film uh, because that seems like such a popular uh, thing. Maybe, maybe it's just in the United States, but. So I'm very new to the festival things. This is my first short film and I started discovering that I even could send it to short films uh, festivals uh, just now when I finished it. So I'm really discovering all my possibilities, but pretty much I'm sending it to anywhere they accept it. <laughs> uh, so yes, for sure I will try to do all, to all these festivals. I would love that, absolutely. Another question, Emily? Please just use the microphone. Good morning, sorry for a very simple technical question, but I was puzzled by, um, mesmerized really by the beauty of your image um, and uh, simply wanted to ask you the limit, the limit between stop motion and 3D animation wasn't clear and I liked this in between and wanted to know what was your process, if not secret. Well, thank you, it's very flattering that you thought it's stop motion, but no, it's full animation, it's all digital and nothing is from maquettes or anything, it's all 3D computer animation. I did use um, some photo scans, which is a technique where you photograph real things and then you can extract like a 3D model out of it, like very realistic model. So that helped me 
in the nature scenes, like the trees and everything. I actually took pictures in the park of trees, and I used those pictures to, to make it like as real as possible. Uh, but everything is uh, done on the computer, so there's no uh, physical part to it. It's very warm. Sorry? It's very warm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much. I'd like now to welcome on stage Gabriel Bomer for Flood is Coming. Hello. Hello. So I hope that uh, all the rain uh, here won't uh, bring us the flood. Let's see. It's coming, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's go back to your film. Uh, we cl clearly perceive the theme of global warming and uh, its consequences. How important was it to you to deal with it? Um, that was really the crux of why I wanted to make the film, um, to deal with kind of this encroaching issue that is um, very time sensitive. Um, it seems like we have a very small window to decide uh, in what direction we want this relationship with ecology to go. So it was very much on my mind. And um, why did you decide to focus on one main character instead of... Uh a community or society? I guess I felt that in, in that discussion about nature, um, there's this conflict within people, um, and the two sides of the discussion can almost be present in, in one person. You know, if, if the way we're talking about it is always to go to extremes, you're either filling sandbags or you're, you're cutting down the forest and building a house. Um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of um, middle ground. And so I, I think individual people can hold opposing views, and that was kind of the thing that I wanted to explore. Most of all, this, this concept that we have this conflict within ourselves and two different perspectives in the head of one person. Yeah, and this character um, has an incredible voice, and the song sticks really... Uh, into our minds. Uh, did you write it and uh, how did you work on that part? <coughs> um, I thought he would be kind of, I don't know if it's even the right word, free singing. So he's just walking around and he's singing. And so there's tapes of me just walking around uh, a, a mountain, uh, just singing those words over and over again until I found kind of a tune which was in a way also tuneless and um, I tried to do it whenever I just woke up and so the deep voice is almost um, a, a reference to his sleepiness and then he's in a constant state of sleepiness and, and confusion of just having woken up. Um, but yeah, the song was very important and, and I worked on it for quite a long time. Yeah. And uh, who is the voice actor? Uh, did you work closely with, uh, with him? It's me actually. Uh, it's me very early okay. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it makes sense since I noticed in uh, the ending credits that uh, you directed, animated, edited, and composed the music. Uh, I didn't know you performed it as well. Uh, did you usually work by yourself? Um, yeah, so far. Uh, my introduction to animation was uh, making music videos for my band, actually. And so I've just always worked by myself in this specific medium. Um, I quite like it because I can just work for 14 hours without any sort of obstacles and, and there's, a, there's a good momentum, but at the same time collaboration can be great. Like my, my guitarist from my band did the music for this one and, and I really loved what he did with it and it was, it was actually quite unexpected. It wasn't at all what I'd asked him to do, for example. Uh, to go back to the graphic design, um, I was wondering what were your references? I, I thought while watching the film uh, about the character of the film um, Vaisha the Blind by Theodor Yushchev. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. Okay, uh, you but should. I can talk. <laughs> okay, yeah, I should definitely. <laughs> I can talk a bit about just the general inspiration. Sure. Um, 
I, I guess I wanted the film to feel a bit nostalgic and maybe innate. And so my first uh, thing I looked at was cave drawings. Um, I always thought the simplicity of cave drawings um, almost not childlike because it's, it is much more sophisticated. Y you look at it and you feel something connected to it. And so I, I wanted to, to uh, establish a connection to that. But then there's all sorts of other visual um, inspirations that I took. There's a uh, uh, Brazilian uh, artist called Ligia Pape who uh, made these woodblock prints and it's usually quite simple geometric shapes made of lines but they never quite meet and I'm, I'm sure I've misinterpreted what she was trying to say but to me there was such a an intense conflict in this concept of, of lines never meeting and so whenever the character is in his most difficult positions he is uh, engulfed by these lines that never quite meet. Um, visually, I was also quite inspired by early experimental films. Uh, there's a film specifically by Hans Richter called um, Dreams That Money Can Buy. And there's a part in there which is actually by Marcel Duchamp, um, which is one of these rotor reliefs that he, he built at one point and and it, it just gave this sense of confusion and um, almost nausea, the way it spins. I, I copied it almost exactly. Um, and and it's, it's also um, going back to his experiments with eyes and things like that. And so I thought that fit really well with the, with the motifs of the film. We won't tell him, I promise. <laughs> um, other questions? Yes, Martin. I thought it was awesome that you had um, such warnings est established about the flood coming, and then we got the fire, right? So <laughs> is that just a method to allow us to totally discredit this uh, Cassandra character? Because y you know that then nobody will ever say, I told you so. <laughs> Although you did say, I told you so. Um, I wouldn't say discredit, maybe. Uh, maybe a, a, a cautionary tale within a cautionary tale. Uh, if, you, if you're so focused on the flood is coming that you're not paying attention to the fact that you're burning down the forest, then uh, that is going to increase the potential um, damage of the flood even more. Well, it looked like there'd been a clear cut going on in the forest before, too. Mm. A clear cut? What well, do you mean by that? I mean that we saw a lot of tree stumps. Yes, exactly, and so that uh, that irritates the character even more. That's a good point because that's kind of the point. This uh, other character is cutting down the forest, weakening it. If there is a flood coming, then that's making everything weaker. And so he's he's perturbed to the point of of conflict. And I, I think oftentimes when people are faced with a, a difficult decision, they seek out conflict for no reason because they need some sort of release. And so. If we think the flood is coming, we need to be careful we don't burn down the forest. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite now Kintis Lundgren and Drashko Itevik for Thomas beneath the valley of wild wolves. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, um, uh, just to explain, um, you work together as a director and producer, right? No, um, I'm the director, but we both co-write co -write the story. And uh, Trashko is a bit better at explaining something, so. He has to be here to answer questions. I cannot. Thank you for being so helpful, uh, <laughs> So in the film, uh, we discovered Thomas. No, sorry, not in the film. In your previous film, Manivolt, we discovered Thomas. Uh, could we consider that this film is uh, a prequel of it? It is a prequel, yes. 
Um, and can we assume that uh, you are building a character-driven universe currently? Uh, absolutely. Would you comment it? Well, like a big inspiration for me is actually Balzac. I, I really used to like Balzac when I was a teenager. I read, I read a, lot of, a lot of his books and I really like how he builds this universe where you read one book and there is some you know, main character and the same character is a side character in another book. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to build a similar universe around my films, you know, that all these characters, like for example in Thomas there is also, we see Herman for a little bit, mm -hmm. if you noticed. I, I don't know, I just wanted to feel like they're, they're real. <laughs> and so is your, is your plan uh, creative and production plan uh, to create a, a series? Yes, uh, and we're also developing a series. It's for adults, so it's impossible to fund it. But uh, I don't know, maybe if it someday happens, it would be awesome. And you started to work uh, closely with uh, friends, French professionals. Would you explain it uh, yes, a bit? Yes, because there is money in France, so... <laughs> <laughs> It might be possible to um, finance the series here. Do you want to say something about that? About France? No. It's too early, too early to say anything. No worry. Let's go back to the, the story itself. Um, is your film a, a feminist testimony? <coughs> Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> it could also be a critique. <laughs> I think it's both. Are you a member of uh, the church that we see in the story? I am the church. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who cleans my house? <laughs> <laughs> what character are you, Trashko? Uh, well, Thomas, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he thinks. Fixing stuff. She, she tries to make me into George, and it's my fault. <laughs> like every woman should. Speaking about uh, characters, uh, I was wondering if uh, Alejandro is uh, Harvey Weinstein. He could be. Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. To me, <coughs> the main inspiration for him was Russ Mayer, though. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Russ Mayer movies. It's because, you know, after I made Money Wild, which is such a quiet, you know, very held back movie, I wanted to make something more crazy and wild. And I really, I like B-movies, and I like uh, Russ Mayer movies. Mm -hmm. Like, he makes this kind of sexploitation. So, he's into boobs. Like, I was thinking maybe I'll just put a lot of wolf butts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's maybe also a little bit inspired by... There is this film called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and there is this Z-Man Barcel who goes crazy in the middle of the film, and the film genre almost changes because he starts killing people and stuff. So I wanted to have this kind of crazy character. But I guess, I mean, yes, there are also, you could talk about the Harvey Weinstein thing also. But then it's also the hound, you know, the Afghan hound. I think actually she is the Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yes. That is what I want to say. Yes. Um, in the film, you question uh, happiness and duties. Is the end of the film the perfect setup to be happy to you? In, in a way, maybe, but uh, we still feel that, uh, let's say that uh, Thomas, he didn't continue with his uh, actor career. You know. So maybe for uh, Vivi, you know, for wife, you know, it's a setup which she likes. But we still feel that Thomas didn't didn't get what he wants, you know. So I think it's a bit of a boat, you know. Like uh, it is, it can be open ending. Is there any other question? So I, I do have another one. What would be the next step in uh, Thomas's life or other characters' <coughs> lives? Well, we already know what's the next step. He's going to be fixing washing machines and he's going to meet Moneyvault. 
and his mother. <laughs> okay, what, what's the previous step? <laughs> the previous? Yeah. Let's go back in time. Oh, yeah. We might go back to Manivald's childhood, actually, because Manivald used to have this uh, little bit disturbing nanny mm -hmm. called Ingeborg, mm -hmm. who likes to read <coughs> Japanese horror stories to Manivald. He's a cross-dressing hedgehog, and uh, I think there's a story that could be told about her. Other questions? About Manival socks, um, just so horror short films. Thing. Okay, thank you guys. Welcome. <laughs> I'd like to invite on stage Boyong Kim for the levers. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. So let's talk about your intention as a director uh, for this film. Did you want to question individual moral? Uh, I just want to uh, show that uh, the battle of uh, the main character, him and himself, and also the um, between the uh, social, how can I say, the, uh, the people, and uh, social yeah, yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. yeah, we we felt that the main character fights against uh, himself, and um, you showed us how the social climbing mm -hmm. and the living standards mm -hmm. are important in uh, your character's life. What, what inspired you to create this character? Is it a pure fiction or is it based on your own experience? Oh yeah, it's, uh, it, it's about uh, it, uh, my uh, past, uh, my experiences. And then also, um, I get uh, sometimes I get inspired uh, from a single photo. And then like, um, uh, the meat factory kind of thing, and then this this one, um, when I when I saw a picture of the meat factory things, and I had to make something about this, mm -hmm. and then or uh, social um, uh <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, 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 what what may maybe Dahe can just help you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so please welcome uh, suddenly Dahe Jung. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What was your question again? Um, my question was about uh, if the, char the main character uh, has been created as a pure fictional character or is it based on your own experience? Yeah, it's both, both mixed. Yeah, yeah. 그 메인 캐릭터가 어 그냥 만들어낸 것 수도 있고 내 익스피리언스에서 나온 거 맞을 것 같아요. 그 그냥 추가로 설명만 듣고 끝나는 것 같아요. 어 어떻게 하지? 어떻게 해야 되지? 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 어떻게 so, <coughs> it's a proper experience. Wait, wait. In your previous films, um, we <coughs> you were based mostly in your personal experience. And um, this one seems to be more social, more global. Uh, is it um, a will that you have for this film and for the upcoming ones? Do you want now to focus less on your personal experience and more um, dealing with global topic or issues? Uh, no, um, I want to focus on my uh, personal thing later. This one uh, is uh, different from my, my other works, right? But I, I prefer to make something like the other ones, not right now. <laughs> 
So to go back to your personal yes. experience yes. in your upcoming films. Yes, yes. It's ki it was kind of difficult to express uh, how to say because I didn't want to judge uh, anything. I just, uh, I just felt sad about the older process. Mm -hmm. So um, it was not easy to, to uh, say as an animation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, w I want to be more easier. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a more general question about uh, South Korea. Uh, this country still uh, has a death penalty and uh, I was wondering if the citizens in Korea uh, are questioning it or accepting it like in the restaurant scene. Mm. They uh, still have that but uh, I, I don't see recently I don't see any uh, 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 what do you call it? Execution or? We say good is done. Come, on the pepper, on the pepper. And people are still not asking what to do about that. Right? Yes. Yes. The la question, je, je passe en anglais pour uh, que ce soit plus pratique. La question était um, la peine de mort existe toujours en Corée du Sud, et uh, je me demandais si les citoyens uh, du Sud coréen um, acceptaient uh, cet uh, état de, de fait, ou comme dans la scène du restaurant, ou si elle était uh, controversée. Some people do, but some people not. But sometimes we uh, the people say like, do it, do it, or or to have to, uh, don't, don't. It's de it depends on the situation yeah. in Korea. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Que vous pouvez également poser en français. Anything you want to add uh, to talk about the film? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dahi. I'd like to welcome now on stage Lynn Tomlinson and Sam Sader for the Elephant Song. Hello. Welcome both. Um, so, you two worked on the film um, together uh, as co-writers. Uh, you, Lin, you directed it, and uh, Sam, you worked uh, as a composer, right? right. Um, how did you work together on this film? Sam is my son, we're a mother-son uh, team. So the way we worked together on this project um, was that I, I had this idea to make a film about this story about this elephant. Um, and I, we, we talked, Sam helps me a lot with the narrative. So we talked a lot about sort of what the structure of the story was and, and we sort of together came up with this idea of the dog being the central narrator. And that was a really crucial moment. Um, and then after that, I sort of had written out a few ideas for the, the structure of the story, and I handed that to Sam, we talked it over, and then, um, and then one morning I woke up to an email with a 12 minute long song <laughs> that was a blues song. We did I decided it should be blues, uh, but um, here I'll pass it to Sam, he can tell about that. Yeah, right, so, so right, so together we created sort of the narrative or the story, um, and then I wrote this, this overly long f first draft and I knew there's no way because the animation is so labor intensive so we had to change sort of the style of the song and we landed in on this sort of Americana um, style which I hope you enjoyed um, and that really sort of opened the possibilities um, in some ways um, for the the type of narrative that we wanted to tell um, and so from there there was some refinement and polishing but um, but yeah, that was that was how the song was born, and so so that was our process. Um, and then 
the animation was just my mom. So the song was set in stone before we started the film. Right. And then my process is that instead of a storyboard, I make a kind of video mashup animatic. Just do it, and I do research as I'm looking for video clips and photographs and paintings. Like I used Hudson River School paintings and also um, some American painters from around the time period in the early 1800s. And then um, I put that all together as a structure, and then it's clay on glass. So I could kind of use the video reference for my timing, and then uh, clay on glass, which is a stop motion process. But then the choruses are a different process. That's oil pastel on video prints. OK. Would you uh, explain a bit more um, uh, your creative process? Because the, the animation is really remarkable, fluent and smooth. And uh, how long did it take you to, uh, to reach <laughs> that uh, level of, uh, <laughs> of high quality animation? Well, I guess there's two answers. One is I've been animating since 1989. So it's taken a long time to get to that level. Um, It takes about three hours to animate one second. I don't really even like to add it up. I've, I know the numbers sometimes, but uh, it, takes, it took a long time. I listen to audiobooks when I work, and I listen to 1,200 hours of books. Um, so the, it's plasticine, kids modeling clay, which is nice. It's non-toxic. It doesn't dry out, and I have all the different colors. And it's top lit. I used to underlight, but this film and my last film, The Ballad of Holland Island House, are both top lit which makes it look more like an oil painting moving. Mm -hmm. And then I'm using this video reference, but then anytime there's a transformation between scenes, that is just improvised. That's my favorite part, where I transform from one scene to the next. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and let's go back to the characters. Uh, you mentioned earlier the dog as a main uh, narrative um, actor. Um, character, sorry. And um, would you tell us a bit more about, uh, about him and also about Old Bet, this okay. uh, elephant, which is based on a true story? That's right. So Old Bet is a real elephant. Uh, it's a historical story about the first elephant, um, the first circus elephant in America. It was the second elephant in America that was um, brought to America and paraded around. And I had heard the story, and I thought the loneliness of this single uh, one of her species all alone, um, that really resonated with me. Um, and, uh, and also the fact that she was sort of, they, at the same time they were excavating mastodon bones, that she was sort of walking on the bones of her extinct ancestors, just uh, that connected with me. But um, I'll get a pass to Sam for a sec, but what really helped was when um, we thought that the elephant, you know, was too noble and the, the man is this evil and that there wasn't any complexity. Mm -hmm. So when we hit on this idea of this dog narrator, that had a kind of complicity and um, was always a domesticated creature, that was key. Yeah, in terms of narrative, what you always are looking for is um, a, a conflict, a tension between two forces and almost sort of this, this liminal, this in-between space, right? And so in between the elephant and the, the farmer, right, is, is the dog who is both has the complicity and the ties to the human world and also to the animal world. And so the film really deals with that, that reckoning. Um, and so that, that's why that character, that's why we created that, that dog character. Um, and that really opened the, the narrative possibilities of the film. Because the dog, you know, what a dog has to do is obey, right? And he wants to please and wants to obey, but it also identifies and, you know, relates to the elephant who's its friend. So it puts it in this position where obedience, he realizes that that's not maybe the best thing to do. And uh, through the film, did you try to deal with um, a more global topic, which is uh, animal mistreatment? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot about this. And um, I think that it's also about, you know, you see the ivory trade, mm -hmm. the references to that. And I think that what it is is that the mistreatment of humans often goes hand in hand with the mistreatment of animals. So I wanted that sort of whole global feeling. Of, and also this, um, it's kind of a diasporic story of, of transportation across the water being you know, d uprooted and dislocated. And I think that's the more general themes that are in the film. I think that covers it. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Martin? Hi, um, <clears throat> I liked it a lot. The, um, often in, in music videos, you're going to have um, uh, the, the problem of the, the visuals 
just replicating the lyrics. This is sort of an unusual situation where you actually have the film concept before you have the song. So I wondered if you had a similar or re reverse um, problem of making the, 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 the lyrics of the song a little too close to like say a storyboard or, or a plan of the, that you may have had. Yeah. This is something that we, we worried about, I think, and we wrangled with. Um, and, and yeah, I think one of, one of my mom's responses to, to some of my early drafts is that um, there wasn't enough space for the, the visuals to tell themselves. Um, and that was something that I struggled with because I didn't want it to, I, I wanted the narrative to be clear, you know what I mean? But I didn't want there to be excessive replication. And I, I and you know, I think with a music video, it's, it's very, I don't consider this necessarily a music video. I'm not offended or anything by the term, but, but with, I think with a music video, the, the visuals are in service to the song. And here, I do think the song ultimately is in service to the, the visual aspect, even though the song is a key component of the film. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope that you think it's, it's successful in that regard because we, it was a very fine balance um, in terms of what is just shown. Um, I think that the choruses help with that because in the choruses, the, the visual component, the, the song is always the same chorus and so we're able to go in these different little journeys, right? And there's the four the four different journeys, the, the mastodons, the ivory trade, the transportation overseas, and then the circus. Um, and these journeys, you don't, you, you have the same accompaniment for, e for each, yeah. And those are more experimental. Um, yeah. There were, and I could put any, any little related tangent that I wanted, I could just have a, a fraction of a frame and then leave it up to the audience to put that part together. Right. So while there's one linear narrative, there's also this world of uh, kind of tangents that are related that are, are a more experimental process. Yeah, and you talk about the you're, you said you're influenced especially by two, by When the Day Breaks and by oh, Crack. Yeah. So When the Day Breaks, well, Crack was Ballad of Falling Out of the House, but oh, in oh, this oh. film, um, When the Day Breaks by Wendy Tilby and Amanda Forbes, we looked closely at how, the, especially the parts where like the chicken's life flashes before its eyes and just tiny frames, how so much could be embedded in such a short amount of time. Right. One last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to invite now Malt Stein for Flood. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello. It works. Welcome. Thank you. How are you? Fine. A bit sunburned, but I'm not going to explode. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> So you do, f do you feel good after receiving your award in Zagreb last week? Uh, yes, very good, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess so. Um, so in your film, it seems that you use the flood as a metaphor. Yes. What does it symbolize? Yeah, of course. It's uh, like a metaphor, as you say, and um, it symbolized actually the mental condition of the boy in a way because um, this boy is uh, like experiencing very difficult qu um, problems um, like um, you know isolation and uh, intolerant friends and uh, also doing drugs and, uh, um, and not to be able to communicate these problems and stuff and this is for a young person this is just very can be very uh, depressing so uh, actually it's um, the depression that uh, collaborates with the image of the flood, so it's uh, like a personal apocalypse that happens. Yeah. Yeah, the character uh, seems to fight between his wills and uh, the social pressure, um, between fantasy and fear as well. Would you comment that a bit further? Um, I had the idea when I developed the story that was also actually something that really convinced me to realize the story, to have this, the idea to bring the subconsciousness into the surface, uh, that comes to the surface and gets an interactive role in the development of the story. So these uh, surreal images you have uh, at the end, um, they are like um, 
nightmarish consequences of all these um, yeah, um, psychotic situations and you know these claustrophobic situations before. So yeah. Yeah, we really um, um, feel that uh, the relationship between the two main characters uh, is twisted and complex, but we feel it more through the atmosphere than through dialogues. Um, how did you write the story? Um, so the dia so when I write a story, uh, it's always um, the fiction and the uh, the reality is very close to each other. <laughs> so actually, all these uh, conf these interpersonal conflicts and the reactions and how they talk to each other, this is not actually my invention. You know, it's some things that I saw and I experienced with people, with friends, and uh, these are very uh, disturbing memories of some. Uh, examples I just uh, know and um, yeah and uh, this is about you know it's very it's an interpersonal failure you know and this is these are very haunting things you are always con keep in mind and it fit really well when you write a story about the uh, age of adolescence you know and have you been uh, inspired by the Oedipus uh, story I don't know that the Oedipus Oedip I Oedipus, uh, Elvis? the the, Gre the Greek uh, ancient. Ah uh, no no no, I don't know that. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> don't be. <laughs> it was uh, I just assumed it, but. Uh, mm. um, and can we consider the end of the film as an happy hen end? No, it's a tra <laughs> it's a tragic end. I mean, it's not very positive and not very happy to wipe things away. So it's more a situation where maybe the boy um, quit with a lot of things and maybe it's kind of happiness, but uh, it's also very tra tragic, you know. It's, um, I mean, it's not something where you really think, ah, oh, yeah. nice. But <laughs> was, it your <laughs> was it your will to, um, to, to, to make an open end? So we can understand it in both ways. Yeah, uh, of c I mean, when you are in this age, you you are not really sure about your future, you know, and you have a lot of, uh, let's say, steps that you have to go through to become an adult, and um, so, of course, there's now space for a lot of new things, you know, when you quit with some things that are just um, like bad for you, then, yeah, yeah, so it's open, yeah, so it could. Actually, I thought also to make uh, something else that happened after, but... What would be the next step for this character? <laughs> I don't know, I had just it was more the fantasy stories. So. Um, any question, yes. Patrick? Hi. Um, so one of, the, one of the parts of your film that really affected me, both within the story and graphically, was the death of the mother. And I was very curious um, why you chose to represent her death so in such a spectacular way. I mean, she grew in scale. And, and it was, it was m my favorite part. But I, I also wondered what your choices were uh, you know, and why you chose to represent it that way. So the death of the mother <coughs> has two disturbing points. <laughs> So, uh, of course, uh, um, I mean, there is, she has universal fears, and then it's uh, like a kind of contradiction that she die in a, in a cozy candle dinner, you know, because uh, actually she, her fears are um, concerned of the world outside, and then she die at home. On the other hand, uh, for the boy, you know, um, I mean, all the characters in my film, they are very affected and they, they uh, think very impulsive. Also, these fantasies are very impulsive. You know, I don't, you know, they're not like moral, there's no moral because they, they, they act from their helpless situation. So uh, the, it's about, you know, and the, and the characters, they feel strong emotions like hate and fear and stuff like this. These are very um, consuming emotions. And when, uh, and maybe, you know, just to consider that he is very affected, maybe he had also in his subconsciousness a kind of wish to get rid of her, you know, and then it happens for real. Um, then uh, the, the feeling of guilt 
uh, could be very uh, irrational and, uh, and very haunting for him. And so um, her death is actually something very, um, yeah, it's something very monstrous that happens, you know, and uh, it expresses also maybe his feeling that he had before that actually, or maybe it's a fantasy of him, you know, that she just mm. grows like a monstrous thing that uh, makes suffo suffocating himself, you know, uh, something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Another question? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And finally, I'd like to invite on stage uh, Lisa Fukaya for Mimi. Hello. So, would you just uh, introduce yourself of course. in a few words? Uh, my name is uh, Rav, Ravenel Reich. Uh, I'm here as a partial interpreter, and if she needs any clarification for any of her uh, reply statements and so on. How are you, Lisa? Yeah, I'm good. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Lisa Fukaya uh, from Japan. Yeah. So, um, Lisa. Your, your film um, has been produced in Denmark. Yes. Though course. you are Japanese. Would yeah. you explain the um, context of uh, creation and production? Uh, I stayed in Denmark for making, uh, uh, making this film uh, as an artist in residency for half a year. <laughs> and do you consider your film as a Japanese film or Danish film? How, how did your stay in Denmark influence or impact your, your work? So, so Mimi is uh, my first uh, independent story show film. So, and uh, before I was working uh, um, as a freelancer, and uh, I have uh, I have never studied about uh, animation uh, before, so so I I think I need a uh, new environment to, uh, for making a short film, and uh, I find the uh, artist lessons in Denmark uh, called the Open Workshop uh, as a uh, in the animation workshop, and uh, I, I I think it's uh, good for getting a uh, new. In inspiration? Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's made. <laughs> yes. Yes. Did your story change uh, during your development process, mm -hmm. uh, or did you have you <coughs> did you came did you come to Denmark mm -hmm. with a uh, validated mm -hmm. uh, story, mm -hmm. or have you changed it during your residency? Yeah, actually, I changed it to uh, uh, um, the storyboard. Mm -hmm. So it's a spent uh, uh, three months. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so first uh, I have a storyboard for Mimi, uh, but uh, I change it to the a bit of story. So during uh, stay in Denmark, uh, because of I met a lot of different artists in open workshop, and I I was influenced to other people. Mm -hmm. So through the character of Mimi, mm -hmm. we feel the social pressure on young women. Yes. How important was it to deal with that topic for you? Yes. Um, so, sorry, can I say that? Talk about your own experiences. My experience? Okay. Uh, yes, so Mimi is uh, actually, from my experience, uh, during uh, junior high school in Japan, uh, we are... Uh, we are usually wearing uh, the same costume and the uh, same hair, so it's a full rule in the school. So, and uh, I feel uh, uncomfortable that's and, and uh, I'm also afraid to define to for, um, from others um, because, uh, uh, mm, so in my opinion, it's uh, so feel strongly, so the same person is uh, the same person to 
Okay, so basically um, she's trying to say that you, you, you kind of feel uncomfortable if you're not able to fit in with the others, but you also don't want to stand out. Like you, really, you don't want to stand out in a situation where everybody's trying to fit in with other people, basically. Thank you. So mm -hmm. the story is based on your personal experience, as you said, but do you consider the film mm -hmm. um, as, an, as universal? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, a lot of people can, can relate to your mm -hmm. film? Yeah, I think, s uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, and more specifically in Japan, or do you think that's a, go a global issue that teenagers face at mm -hmm. some point? Yes, Is it a global problem or just Japan? Just Japan. Global or even like global? Mm, so, I don't think so. Um, so, I have uh, only so Expense in Japan, so but uh, so Mimi, I think uh, so Mimi the character is a uh, like everyone sometimes feel like uh, so strange to to define to from others. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's talk about the um, the design mm -hmm. uh, and the animation. Would you tell us about the techniques that you used, including the the layers and the gradients, the shades of red? Yeah, so. I used uh, f uh, Mimi is a full digital uh, f show film, so and I'm using uh, uh, animated CC and Photoshop, and uh, sometimes uh, so I draw as a watercolor and for the texture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and would you comment the um, the choice of colors? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons is uh, so the Mimi is a uh, short for about uh, so pimple, yeah, and uh, so it looks it's a uh, so real looks is a uh, gross I think so but uh, so I I try to the to the simple more graphic uh -huh. and uh, so I guess it's uh, it's good for uh, pink it's a pinkish to frame for. So she wanted the film to be a lot more lighthearted, um, deal with a, a kind of a an uncomfortable theme in a more lighthearted way. So she chose pink as a more um, easy to understand or a, lo a lot more relaxing sort of color color palette to uh, to express uh, your your theme. Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, other questions. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Merci à tous. C'est donc la fin de ce petit déjeuner. Le dernier aura lieu demain matin avec Marcel Jean sur la dernière session de, de court métrage en compétition, donc numéro 5, et les courts métrages en compétition off limits. Je vous souhaite une très bonne journée.
Festival international du film d'animation d'Annecy. <rire> Thank <laughs> you.